Hey everybody, let me make this on the right screen and go big. Am I gonna see myself the whole time? Hi. All right, so this one is a quick little mini lecture on post-war America. So typically in class, we would be talking about bell ringers at the beginning of class. So why might Congress and the Senate both full of Republicans and de Democrats passed the Federal Highway Act in 1956. Well, for several reasons. One, um, connecting primarily um, economic centers was really important. And you see through this shift, um, a shift from railroads as our primary mode of transporting goods across the country to uh, trucking actually being our primary mode of transportation. Nowadays, everything gets put on a truck or an airplane and sent all over the country. And part of that is due to interstate highway systems. The other thing is that during the war, it became very evident that we could not quickly mobilize armies um, and get them across the country very quickly and rapidly and all of the war materials they would need. And so um, it was decided that we needed the Interstate Highway Act to also facilitate the movement of our military personnel as well. So we're going to try and focus here on the growth of suburbs in the 1950s and 60s, explain how changes in post-war government policies and ideology um, transformed residential patterns where people lived, city centers, suburbs, etc., and explain how the car and highways transformed our lives. So I recommend, I don't have a note sheet for this, I would give you a second or you can just pause the video, set up um, a note sheet like this and just jot down some notes that you see in here in these four categories, peace, fear, conformity, and rebellion um, in this time period. So we're going to start with fear. There is a distinct fear coming out of World War II of communism. Um, even though the Soviet Union was one of our greatest allies during the war, as soon as the war was over, that love relationship ended and we are now not even frenemies. People were enemies. Um, we see the Iron Curtain come down in Europe and then there is an intense buildup of atomic weapons by both the Soviet Union and by the United States. This results in civilians having a fear of atomic weapons and so people start building civil defense shelters. And in fact, here in um, our own community, just south of town at the ice caves, um, that was our local civil defense shelter. We were to evacuate to that area. Um, it could hold a thousand or so people potentially, not comfortably, mind you, and it is a cave um, for who knows how long if there were to be an airstrike. And Idaho actually was a target, partly because of the Idaho National Laboratory. If you've ever driven over towards Arco, you've seen, or seen it, and that is actually where the first nuclear reactor in the United States was created. You also have the red scare that um, was in the previous videos, we, we saw the House Un-American Activities Committee and the Senator Joseph McCarthy hearings. There's this like fear of communism infiltrating all aspects of life. And then you have this arms race, which is, um, comes up with this acronym of mutually assured destruction. Basically the idea is I'll get weapons, you get weapons, my weapons will destroy your weapons, and your weapons will destroy my weapons, and the planet will be gone, and that's what's going to keep us from using our weapons. It really doesn't make sense, but that's how it was used and why we justify building more and more weapons. So um, we're going to talk about how these things... Um, impacted daily life. And in fact, if you go to Schoology, you'll see a little video, a duck and cover video that was used in elementary schools to train students on how to prepare for a nuclear attack. Just in Nevada was the Nevada testing grounds or the Nevada proving grounds. And it was about 65 miles from Las Vegas. And between 1951 and 1992, there were 200 or 928 announced nuclear tests and 828 of those were underground. People would 
sit outside with sunglasses on and you can in fact see them. You can see this right here from the Golden Nugget here on the Vegas Strip. Um, and people would watch them and then the side effect of that, let's see if this plays. It's kind of interesting. Ooh, it's gonna play. Put your sunglasses on. Safety first. This is the most ominous music. And they would do things like measure shock waves and whatnot. And these guys are out there filming. They don't have their sunglasses on. Just turn your back, fellas. Nothing to see here. But these tests would shoot radioactive material 40,000 feet into the jet stream. And that fallout would land all over the country. Yeah, that looks great. Anywho, there you have it. Fallout from nuclear tests and atomic bomb tests, you can see right here per capita. Iodine-131 was the big uh, isotope that was falling as a result of this. And in fact, here in Idaho, and you can see it, Blaine County had some of the highest rates of uh, fallout from these tests. It would basically be launched here, go straight up the jet stream, dip down, and at times it even made it all the way out to Washington, D.C. It often was described by local residents here in Idaho as um, like summer snow. It would fall as ash on the ground and um, people would, you know, their cows would be eating the grass. And, and we have higher rates of thyroid cancer in this area as a result of that. So people were building these fallout shelters and practicing duck and cover drills because, yeah, Hiding under your desk is really going to protect you. But that's what we did with kids at this time. All right. So, um, and I still remember as a kid being very terribly afraid of nuclear weapons. Not that I shouldn't be now, but it doesn't seem as big of a deal as when I was a kid. The other piece was conformity. There was an absence of difference in pop culture, very little diversity. Um, Historians cite widespread uh, watching of television shows like Leave it to Beaver, Lassie, and Mr. Ed. Uh, you also see a renewed popularity in religion at this time. Leave it to Beaver pro promoted this ideal of the nuclear family, mom, dad, um, two kids, mom stays at home and works, which was not necessarily the reality of most families in this time. Teenagers were, um, for the first time, viewed for their powers of consumption. They became a market that could be sold to. Um, and television shows were specifically marketing to teenagers through music and um, other pop culture icons. So TV is really big and shows huge, enormous growth in this time. Everybody starts to get television. And you also see demographic shifts. People are moving out of inner cities into suburbs. Part of this is economic prosperity and the GI Bill, which allowed for um, returning GIs to, to get low interest mortgages, as well as um, everybody just wanting a piece of their own little pie. Part of this can be attributed also to some white flight um, most of these suburbs were developed and had exclusive neighborhoods that prohibited minorities from even um, purchasing homes in them. So this idea of the suburb, little houses um, made of tiki-taki, they were made cheaply. You had different floor plans that you could choose from, particularly in Levittown. Um, and dad would get on the, the train and go into the city and work every day and come home and mom would be there ready to take care of his every need. Um, you also have an increase in church attendance during this time uh, as a kind of response to communism, which people viewed as being very uh, unreligious and sacrilegious to, to an extent. And 
you had the addition of the words under God into the Pledge of Allegiance and to put on the bill. You have um, lots of revivalist preachers. So we're seeing another revival happen at this time. Baptist colleges being formed, those sorts of things. But as a result of all of this, what you have are also in urban areas sort of growing urban decay, partly due to large segments of the population, primarily whites, leaving those areas and leaving essentially a financial void uh, when the um, minorities are left in these segregated cities. These are in fact not um, what we call de jure segregation, which was like Jim Crow forced by law segregation. This is what we call de facto segregation, where people just make choices and they leave or they move and areas become segregated that way. So this is Detroit in 1971 after um, you have a significant period of people moving to the suburbs. And you can see pretty much downtown Detroit becomes an exclusively African-American neighborhood. And as we move into the 70s and 80s, and the auto American auto manufacturers are unable to keep up with um, cheaper, more fuel efficient uh, Japanese and European cars, American auto workers start getting laid off. Um, and that really adds to this economic crisis and blight as well. So here you go. You have happy moms and dads heading to the neighborhoods. But in these places, a lot of times these suburbs had racial covenants or sort of um, housing association rules, which have the effect of law, basically, that you couldn't have them occupied by anyone other than of the Caucasian race. Um, but you could hire non-Caucasian help, but they couldn't live there. Um, pools, local public pools, often barred minorities um, and and banks would not loan to minorities, etc. So it was not only white flight, but there was some rules put in place to also in the North, not just in the South, prohibit African Americans and other minorities from enjoying this economic boom that was happening in um, the country. You also had products being marketed to African-American teenagers um, like skin whiteners and hair straighteners. This ideal of the American beauty was light skin, straight haired. And so um, you saw this in beauty products. You can also see these demographic shifts from 1950 to 1970 when we look at the numbers of people living in urban areas by race and the number of people in um, suburban areas. So in 1950, you have um, a white population here in this city of 135,000 whites. Um, and that is a, you know, you start to see those numbers go down as time goes on. Um, and you can see that here, the percentage of change as people move out of the city. Looking at white and African-American populations, they differ in their suburban areas and growth rates. You can see um, these folks are moving into those cities as well. So you also, with the, the economic crunch happening by the time we get into the 70s with the auto manufacturers in what we now call essentially the Rust Belt, um, you start to see migration, another large migration nationally towards the West and the South. So it's almost a reverse of the great migration of the 1920s and 30s. Um, although African-Americans aren't typically the ones moving, these are uh, middle-class white Americans typically moving. All right, this period is also known as a period of peace. Um, where people lived in suburbs, watched TV, and were consumers. Uh, after the war, this, you know, trying to prevent the bonus army situation that happened after World War I, the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, also known as the GI Bill, was passed by Congress, and this gave um, 
low interest loans for homes. It also allowed them to go to college. So we start to see more students in college than ever in the post-war era, including women at this time. Um, and, you know, as all of that, like, how are we making this ideal living? What's the American dream? You see uh, starting of goods and services that encourage convenience for the housewife, for the family. So Ray Kroc and, and the McDonald's brothers create McDonald's in 1954 and Kroc encourages them to franchise this business. I just love the price of a hamburger it was 15 cents at this time. Wouldn't that be great? And essentially now we're looking at McDonald's as a multinational corporation. So this is on the movie list. Feel free to watch it. This is the... Um, I know what you're thinking. How the heck does a 52-year-old over-the-hill milkshake machine salesman build a fast food empire with 1,600 restaurants and an annual revenue of $700 million? One word. Persistence. Prince Castle Sales. Hi, Jim. Hey, how's it going down there? Good. Well, a lot of interest. We got an order. Six All minutes. right. So you can watch the founder. Um, you also see advertising and consumerism, um, sort of the the Fifth Avenue advertising companies and the, the Madison Avenue advertising companies really creating these slick advertisement campaigns to market specific to specific groups of people, including women and teenagers and working men. And um, that included cigarette smoking. Uh, so joyful. Then you have this period of rebellion that starts in the 1950s um, that actually inspires a youth culture moving into the 60s. This is the baby boomer generation. These are my parents. They're growing up in the 1950s and 60s. And ultimately, um, they will attend college in huge numbers and they will change our economy pretty dramatically um, and they will participate in the Vietnam War, start an environmental movement and women's movement, a civil rights movement. So there's some backlash to all of this and it kind of gets its start in the beatnik poetry and rock and roll fa phase, people pushing back against that conformity. If you've never read any Jack Kerouac, I highly recommend. Um, William S. Burroughs is interesting. He's kind of wacky. I'm pretty sure he was high all the time. Uh, but these folks abhorred the complacency and what they viewed as kind of the blahness of middle America. So you have these growing movements that are going to, to be sparked by this generation. Um, beat poets included Ginsburg. This is Bob Dylan um, and Kerouac pretty famous Americans. You had rock and roll, which actually is inspired by um, African-American roots and blues music. And Elvis really took it to the mainstream. And he was so controversial when he first went on the Ed Sullivan show, they had to like only film him from the waist up because he, they, he was so scandalous with his pelvis. Uh, female stereotypes were pretty stringent during this time. Popular culture and media uh, enforced gender roles about this domesticity and women should be home and taking care of kids and family. But the reality was 37% of women were still employed. Um, that came down a little bit. And by 1950, that was 32% because men were coming back from the war. And by 1940, 13.8% of married women were working and more were going to college. But their wages were low, averaging 60% of a man's, and there was not much room for advancement. And most of those jobs were in traditional women's work, teaching, secretarial, etc. cetera. Um, so, you know, it was that generation of women that started to really push boundaries in the, the late 60s and 70s saying we need to expand the role of women in our society beyond mothers and um, raising children. All right, there you go. That's the 50s.